Good afternoon. It is Tuesday, February 21st, 1235 in the afternoon, and the Committee on State and Local Government and Veterans uh, uh, Affairs uh, is called to, to order. Members, we're going to do a mix of things today. Uh, we're going to begin with overviews from the Department of Revenue and then the Department of MMB, and then we're going to hear a number of bills uh, before we wrap up on time. It's a full day and a snowy day, so we want to be respectful of everybody's time. And with that, I'd like to invite uh, Commissioner Marquart uh, up to the witness table uh, to begin our day. Commissioner Marquart, it is a pleasure to see you here in the Minnesota Senate. And as I said earlier, earlier life uh, has ways of twists and turns. And so here we are together, a couple of former House members. Um, here today to talk about um, the Department of Revenue and the budget. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I am Paul Markworth, the Commissioner of Revenue, and I'm joined here by Deputy Commissioner Lee Ho. And uh, likewise, it's an honor to be here in front of your uh, committee and appreciated very much our time in the House uh, together all those years. So, Madam Chair and members of the committee, uh, we are here to present the governor's uh, budget proposal for the Department of Revenue. And as you know, uh, our main task of the Department of Revenue is to administer and enforce uh, the assessment and collection of our state's revenue. And our mission is working together to fund the future uh, for Minnesota. And we take that work in the Department of Revenue uh, very seriously. We feel we are as many agencies are, a window for the public into how state government functions. And we know that uh, that impression uh, can build and keep the faith and confidence that people have in our democracy and our government on what we do. So that's why this budget request is so important. So if we look here, this is kind of just to set the stage. Uh, this is uh, where we're at as far as what the department does and you can see all the various customers and I won't repeat that but you can see there's a lot of interaction with the Department of Revenue and ultimately the department collects about 33 billion dollars of revenue every year and we do that with an expense at the department of about 188 million dollars so that means we collect about 175 dollars to every one dollar of overhead and so when you think of administration costs and so forth, you think 5% might be good. This overhead administration on the Department of Revenue is 0.6 of 1% uh, overhead, which I think is pretty impressive. So um, moving to the next slide then, Madam Chair, here is our uh, the governor's and lieutenant governor's request. Is a $15.6 million increase in the budget in the first year of the biennium. And then an additional about $10 million uh, into the next, which would be an increase off the base of about 25.9 into the next uh, year. So the total biennial increase is 41.6 million. It's about 11.9% increase. And it is basically to maintain our current staffing levels and make sure we can provide that top-notch service that people have come to expect. Uh, we have looked at our department and structured it in a way that prioritizes and assembles our work into three areas. Uh, work that impacts our people, work that impacts our customer, and work that impacts our infrastructure, and we can look at our budget request in the same manner. So the first one is uh, people. The, the staff, maintaining critical staffing levels. 82% um, of the increase of our uh, budget request is for maintaining staff levels. And because of attrition the last few years and COVID and so forth, we've, the department has lost uh, about 100 uh, full-time equivalency. So it's trying to build that back to get back to existing levels. And also another big factor in the reason for increase in this request is the increase in labor costs. Because of the tight job market that we have right now, um, to recruit folks and maintain our top-notch 
uh, personnel at the department. We've had to increase uh, those rates, and also it's a shift towards more knowledge-based people. So that operating adjustment allows us to maintain these critical levels uh, and meet the existing job market to make sure we can keep folks uh, at the department and, and recruit uh, new qualified folks. Uh, customers, very important. Uh, as I mentioned in the earlier slide, we have tons of customers, a lot of people, uh, the three million that files income tax, 500,000 businesses, uh, assessors and so forth. Um, we have been able to maintain our levels even though some phone hold times and email response times have dropped a bit. They're still within our standards, still rank high among the enterprise, but, but has dropped a bit because of a loss uh, in FTEs. Uh, also, one important part that we do at the Department of Revenue is educate taxpayers. We are in a voluntary compliance situation, and the more we can educate uh, the public on how to complete their filings, uh, the easier it makes for them and a more efficient system. So we want to do more outreach. Some things we'd like to do into the future, uh, uh, for example, right now if you have an amended return, you have to do that by paper. We would like to do that by e-file. Also, we'd like to expand on our virtual walk-in uh, services. Uh, that would be great. So we, um, with the Department of Revenue, people have come to expect high service as they should, and this budget request will allow us to do that. And finally, um, ongoing IT support and inflationary demands. Uh, one of the big things besides processing our tax returns and getting back refunds to taxpayers is making sure we protect their data. Data privacy is paramount. And so one of the things we have is a gen tax. That is basically the main thing that processes our taxes. Uh, that costs $6 million a year just to operate that software and to maintain it and so forth. So this is a very important part. And about 17% of our increase of that total $41.6 million is to deal with um, uh, IT. And finally, our last one here is uh, we have... Uh, we have gone to a hybrid work model, which is working very, very well. Uh, and that is um, something we're committed to and working towards. And over that time, we have been able to uh, create some savings uh, in leased spaces as we uh, are able to work uh, more from home. And we're probably going to look at an annual savings of the, with this hybrid approach of about $2 million a year, ultimately, on lease space reduction. So, so Madam Chair, uh, the department uh, provides crucial services to our customers, the taxpayers, and others. And uh, our excellent employees at the Revenue Department want to continue to provide that high level of service. And this budget request will allow uh, the department to do that. So on behalf of the governor and lieutenant governor, um, we're honored to make this budget request. And that concludes my testimony. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Marquardt. And members, I know that the commissioner has uh, a time constraint. So are there questions for the commissioner before he leaves us? <laughs> All right, then. Uh, commissioner Marquardt. Deputy Commissioner Ho, thank you so much for being with us today, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank you so much. And I would then next invite uh, Deputy Commissioner Rattan. Um, and Deputy Commissioner, uh, I will say I've heard your name pronounced, you know, multiple ways, so you're going to say it for us on the record, and then I'm going to have it in my head. Um, but we're really, really glad that you're here. Uh, I know your presentation is a little bit longer. Um, and I, I, I think that's important. So welcome to the committee. Um, please introduce yourselves and proceed. 
Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Britta Rayton, uh, Deputy Commissioner with Minnesota Management and Budget, and I am joined by George Shardlow, our Legislative Director. So thank you so much for the opportunity today to present uh, the Governor and Lieutenant Governor's uh, FY 24-25 budget recommendations for Minnesota Management and Budget. Um, George is, is pulling up our slides here, and so in just a moment, they will be up on the screen. Um, but really, uh, what our budget is about, if you'll go to slide two, George, um, is optimizing our state operations and maximizing our state resources. So from accounting and budgeting to human resources and employee development, MNB provides central essential services that are the backbone of state government and foundational to every program and service that the state provides. Um, if you go to the next slide, George. So the proposals before you today are about securing and maintaining the services that we have. They're also about enhancing and transforming government broadly to better serve the people of Minnesota into the future. And throughout the presentation, you'll get a sense of the wide ranging issues under MMB's purview. Because of our role within state government to provide agencies with the building blocks necessary to fulfill their own missions, the bulk of these budget recommendations are in, are in fact enterprise in nature. So they're not just about the operations of N MMB, but of, of the whole state government enterprise. So I'm gonna start with our first uh, recommendation, and this is for funding to secure and sustain our statewide enterprise resource planning systems. You'll often hear us refer to these as our ERP systems. And first I wanna just start by talking about the broad scope of these systems. The systems support the work of state government in the areas of accounting, human resources, payroll, and learning management. And it really can't be overstated that these systems are, are truly uh, the foundation of operations of every agency in state government. And currently, we do not have a sustainable and adequate funding model to maintain and enhance these essential systems. And for too long, we've been underfunding these core enterprise needs. Both external consultants and the OLA have pointed to the need for a sustainable funding source for our enterprise ERP systems. So um, before I dive into the details of the ask, I just wanna highlight that this ask is representing the beginning of a multi-phased process. We know that we ultimately need to migrate to the next generation of technology and this ask is really putting us on the course to do so. There are many issues with not providing adequate funding for operations and maintenance of a system that's this integral to the operations of state government. There is risk from both a security perspective and a performance perspective. So we have not had sufficient resources historically to adequately update our systems on the schedule that's needed which means that we have been updating one system at a time with the others falling out of support in the process. Additionally, we currently are not able to make enhancements to the systems that the users are requesting. So our agency partners are requesting enhancements to the system, but because we don't have additional resources, we can't make those updates. So this results in agencies implementing their own subsystems to meet their needs, thus creating inefficiencies. Because rather than addressing the need on the enterprise level, it's addressed agency by agency. So if you turn to the next slide, uh, what I want to highlight today is that we've really reached a critical tipping point in our funding for these systems. We currently spend, on average, approximately $22 million per year to maintain and operate these systems. But only $19 million of that funding is from ongoing, reliable sources. Under current law, we have the ability to bill other agencies up to $10 million per year for these systems. The remainder of what we consider our sustainable funding comes from MMB's general fund and other funding sources at MMB, such as uh, billing of our CGIP funds or our insurance program funds. We have been supporting approximately $3 million of the basic operations and maintenance every year from one-time resources. Primarily, that one-time resource has been the accrued balance in our statewide systems account. But these funds are now depleted. So 
So we, don't, we no longer have a crude balance in that account to rely on. So without additional investment this year, our system resources would be limited to just the 19 million per year in sustainable funding sources. Meaning without additional investment, we wouldn't be able to spend the same amount we're spending this year. We'd actually see a reduction in that spend. Next slide, George, thank you. So the recommendation calls for both short-term and long-term solutions to our ERP funding. Our request in the short term is general fund resources to maintain our systems, meaning adequately funding their operations and maintenance. That general fund ask includes filling the, the gap, as I mentioned, um, to bring our support to adequate levels, as well as providing resources to enhance our systems strengthen our security features, and begin to transition these systems to the cloud. In addition, we are also seeking general fund money to begin the work of moving to the next generation of ERP by mapping our current business process and building a business case to evaluate the next generation of our ERP solution. The long-term strategy for sustainable, reliable, and adequate funding of these systems is to lift that statutory cap on the amount we're allowed to bill our agency partners. In addition, we've established an agency advisory group to consult with MMB and collaborate on ERP services enhancements in the billing amounts into the future. So moving to our, our next uh, ask, this funds uh, the existing services at MMB into the next biennium. So this is our, our operating ask at MMB. And as you know, every year the costs rise due to inflationary pressures. So this ask is really funding those growing costs due to expected growth in compensation, growth in employer paid insurance costs, as well as growing severance costs and other IT cost increases. I do want to note, similar to uh, what Revenue mentioned earlier, that some of our anticipated growth in costs at MMB is offset by savings in our lease costs. And this is due to uh, re the fact that we're reducing our leased space beginning in FY24. Um, but those savings do not cover all the costs of maintaining services, which results in our ask of you today. So our next uh, request is our financial leadership and oversight capacity request. Over the last decade, our state programs and financial structures have become increasingly complex. Um, some examples of this, the number of appropriation accounts in the accounting system has grown by almost 30% over the last 10 years. Also in the last 10 years, the amount of federal dollars we are receiving as a state has grown from approximately 8 billion to 22 billion. However, as a state government has grown in size and complexity, our centralized financial monitoring and compliance functions have not grown at the same pace. There are some divisions within MMB that have uh, smaller staffing complements than they did 20 years ago. At the same time, due to demographic changes and workforce pressures, state government at large is losing experienced financial leaders and staff. So this proposal expands MMB's ability to provide financial support and leadership to the enterprise in response to these changes by adding some capacity in key divisions across the agency. So in particular, this proposal expands our statewide federal funds coordination to continue work on implementing um, specific federal funding packages, including the IIJA. We currently have staff that are doing this work, but they are funded with one-time resources. This also expands our capacity for budget analysis and monitoring. This would allow our teams to better support agencies through the budget process and provide better financial oversight. This expands staffing and results management and program evaluations. Um, that includes building on our analytical and st statistical uh, evaluation capacity. In addition, this uh, 
proposal adds um, some FTE in our banking and payroll services area to address growing tax compliance demands and respond to increasing requests from agencies for assistance. And then uh, finally, this also adds an additional FTE in our debt management team um, to expand our regulatory compliance activities to improve our financial oversight of the state's debt portfolio. I'm turning to the next ask. This is about our enterprise continuity capacity. Um, MMB coordinates continuity of operations planning for all executive branch agencies. The multiple critical events in recent years have highlighted the need to move beyond our very manual processes for, uh, for continuity planning, to move to a statewide software tool, <laughs> excuse me, to better support our continuity of operations work. In addition, um, trends indicate a rise in potential workplace violence incidents, which has shown us that there is a need for more education, training, and planning around preparedness and response. So this ask is for uh, software solutions to help with our continuity of operations planning, as well as additional um, FTE within that unit to support that work. Our next ask is for a statewide internal audit office at MMB. Um, as part of a, an enterprise effort to enhance oversight and internal controls, this uh, proposal is seeking to establish this office at MMB. So not all agencies have the capacity to have an internal auditor on their staff. Um, less than half of the cabinet agencies actually have an, an internal auditor on their staff. So the staff in this central office at MMB would be available to provide audits and technical expertise to agencies that lack their own internal auditor and could focus on audit issues that may span multiple agencies. Uh, these positions would help uncover internal audit weaknesses and fix them before they become bigger issues of fraud, waste, or abuse. So this request is for five FTE to establish this office at MMB. Uh, our next request is uh, to enhance our statewide planning strategy and performance management functions at MMB. Um, as you well know, the state enterprise is a large organization where often urgent needs draw attention away from long-term strategic planning, um, policy research, and some of the cross-agency, cross-disciplinary work to address future issues. Uh, this recommendation would build out capacity to provide the needed staffing for policy and data analysis, strategic and long-range planning. Uh, Minnesota has not had a centralized planning function in state government since 2003, when the entity Minnesota Planning was eliminated. Other large organizations, public and private, recognize that this is a critical function, particularly in, in an organization of this size. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Just let me, in a moment, interrupt for a moment to say a quorum is present. Thank you. OK. So this proposal would establish a unit at MMB to do this work with a staff of 15 FTEs when fully implemented. The unit would work across agencies and help address pressing issues that are critical to the future success of Minnesota, but do not live squarely within one agency's jurisdiction. This next uh, change item is to provide sustainable funding for the Children's Cabinet. So the Children's Cabinet request is for $1 million from the general fund each year, beginning in FY24. And this would establish dedicated funding for the administration and staffing of the Children's Cabinet, which is currently supported through interagency billing. And this change would be more consistent with um, how this, this sort of work is funded in other states. Um, so moving away from the interagency billing model to a direct appropriation. Excuse me. <laughs> um, our last uh, request is a recommendation that supports the establishment of a new agency the Department of Children, Youth, and Families. I'm going to step and just grab a water real quick. <laughs> Thank you. Take your time.
Pardon me. Okay, so this proposal creates a transition process for that new agency that allows us to take the time necessary to get it right. The process includes obtaining, <coughs> pardon me, authority and resources to support the transition to the new agency in two, two years to plan and begin that transition. Um, in closing, uh, MMB is a central service agency charged with providing foundational supports that enable state government as a whole to function efficiently and effectively with the necessary and appropriate services, tools, and oversight <coughs> to successfully serve the people of Minnesota. The investments we are asking you to make will benefit Minnesota state government as a whole and ultimately the people, businesses, and communities of Minnesota. Thank you. Nice work. Excuse my coughing attack. <laughs> uh, it always seems to happen at the worst times. Apparently too much talking does it to me. <laughs> All right, well, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> members, uh, do you have questions? Uh, Senator Anderson, and welcome to the committee today. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this new uh, department that you're uh, advocating for uh, the Department of Children, Youth, and Families. Uh, how many FTEs are you expected to need to make this fully operational? Deputy Commissioner Rayton. Um, Senator Anderson, this is really um, a t a funding for a transition office to begin the work of taking portions of DHS, portions of MDE, and portions of DA DPS and combining them. So it's really not about adding additional FTEs, it's, it's about changing the configuration. <coughs> Senator Anderson. So Madam Chair, Ms. Rattan, uh, there is no, no need for the, the money because you've already got the money to within all the agencies to make that happen. It's just realigning the decks on the Titanic. Deputy Commissioner Rattan. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Anderson, uh, no, there is funding for the transition office at MMB. That is staffed to facilitate this work. Let me get you the FTEs associated with that. But the new agency itself would be moving staffing from other existing agencies. I believe it's seven, but let me get, get to the right number. You're not sure if it's seven or not? Senator Anderson, uh, the deputy commissioner is just... Uh, looking through her documents to make sure that she has the right number. I just don't want to misspeak. We appreciate that. And there's <laughs> time for you to check. And I'm wondering if our fiscal analyst might have an answer as well. I, uh, I've got it. I apologize. Eight. It's eight. eight. <laughs> it's eight. I knew it was in the ballpark of that, but this is staff. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. This is staff at, um, at, that would be housed at MMB that would facilitate this transition. Um, so this would be the staff that would help put together kind of the infrastructure of the new agency in terms of making, making sure the IT systems are moving over, the, fi the financial structures and the HR structures, which is why MMB is housing this function. Senator Anderson. So, Madam Chair, uh, this agency will be outside or will it be underneath the over, uh, umbrella of uh, MMB? Deputy Commissioner Rayton. Madam Chair, Senator, outside of MMB. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> You're welcome, Senator Anderson. Are there other questions for the Department of Management and Budget? Senator Barr. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and you may have covered this. I got here late, but this is a transition office, so these would be temporary employees, and then they would be terminated at the, uh, at the, after the transition is complete, or would they be absorbed somewhere else at that point? Deputy Commissioner Ritton. Madam Chair, Senator Barr, they are temporary employees. All right. Seeing no further questions, we really appreciate you being here and spending a little time with us to present this budget overview. Thank you. I hope you find a cough drop. <laughs> I've got them in my bag, actually. <laughs> All right, members, as um, we talked at the start, and now uh, with the quorum present, we're going to begin our work on some bills. Some of these we're going to move uh, through the committee and on to the next stop, and some we will lay over in this committee. And I'd like to welcome first Senator Westland 
to join us uh, on Senate File 323. Welcome to the committee, Senator Westland. I think it's your first visit, and we're happy to have you. Um, I'd like to move Senate File 323, so it's before the committee, and if you'd like to begin by introducing yourself and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, committee members. This is my first time in front of this committee, so I appreciate the opportunity to bring this bill forward. Um, so we are looking at Senate File 323, which amends current statute 118A.09. Um, that statute provides um, some um, authority for um, municipalities uh, to be able to invest funds. Um, what this bill does is it adds a second category. So currently, um, county or statutory or home rule charter cities with a population of more than 100,000 are able to invest. Um, we are adding uh, a provision that says um, county statutory or home rule charter cities whose most recent long-term uh, general obligations are double A or higher within the last 18 months would have the opportunity to um, uh, invest in some other types of investment vehicles. As we know, uh, given levels of inflation, um, many governments have been investing in fixed income securities that have not really kept up with inflation. And so this is an opportunity for, um, for these entities, including uh, lo local government insurance pools, to be able to invest in, in some other types of uh, vehicles that are, of course, technically a little bit more risky, um, but um, it does provide them the opportunity to take funds that would typically use, be used for long-term investments rather than short-term investments. Um, so I have a couple folks here, and you guys can flip a coin to see who speaks first, but um, uh, the two testifiers today have far more technical knowledge uh, than I on this particular matter. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Westland, and welcome to the committee, the mayor from Robbinsdale. Mayor, Thank is it Blonigan? Blonigan right? with a B L O N I G A N, unlike your uh, materials there. Thank you for the correction. Please proceed. So, Madam Chair, Senators, uh, Bill Blonigan, Robbinsdale Mayor, in the 42 years I've been on the Robbinsdale City Council, only two as mayor, I've often thought, how does our city, uh, inner ring, blue collar suburb, not with uh, a lot of industry, make revenue without taxing the taxpayers. And so, as Senator Westland indicated, this is an opportunity for AA cities and AA plus, of which Robbinsdale is one, uh, to make a little bit more money with a minimal amount of risk, really. Um, last year, I was advised that France has a AA bond rating. We have AA plus. So, it's not like AA and AA plus are not good bond ratings. Formerly, only a 100,000 city or a city with the perfect AAA rating could do this. And um, Senator Westland explained a lot of what I would do, what I would have explained. And so um, to cut to the chase um, and save your time in this snowstorm uh, time period here, um, we will be able, if we can make more money, on our investments to um, either give relief to the taxpayer, provide more services, or both. And this um, bill is conservative in that what the bill allows is we, like AAA cities or 100,000 population cities, will be able to only invest 15% of certain types of reserves this is not 15% of our reserves, it's 15% of certain types of our reserves. And in the bill, uh, it's, it says uh, on lines 2.12 through approximately 2.19 uh, that a qualifying city, which we would now be one of, may only invest in its funds that are held for long-term capital plans authorized by the city council or county board or long-term obligations of the qualifying government. Long-term obligations and qualifying 
of the qualifying in government include long-term capital plan reserves, funds held to offset long-term environmental exposure, other post-employment uh, post benefit liabilities, compensated absences, and other long-term obligations. So we have the reserves because we get our money, as you well know, late in the um, year. We have reserves to run our government. That, those kind of reserves not, aren't necessarily going to be able to be used. It's the, these special types of reserves, which are the long-term obligations that we've set aside to get a new fire truck in five years, to pay for our pensions, for the firefighters, et cetera. So again, I just want to triple emphasize that it's 15% of only certain reserves. I'm looking at my wife's um, Minnesota Deferred Comp um, um, advice from the Minnesota State Board of Investment, which shows that last year many of these funds went down. And so that's a question that you might have. Her particular fund, Vanguard Dividend Growth Fund, went down 4.88%. A lot of them went down almost 20%. Over a course of, and so you might ask, well, what's going to happen? Are the taxpayers going to be mad? that there was a, um, a loss in these certain types of uh, reserves in one particular year. You have probably not heard, at least I haven't, from cities of 100,000 or AAA cities that um, they've been losing monies on these things. They all have finance directors like we do. In, you know, I knew last year that things were gonna go down. I would be scared, and I would be scared this year as a mayor to recommend that we invest a lot of our um, eligible 15% reserves should this pass in these types of things. So we're gonna be just like you, we're gonna be um, diligent with the taxpayer's money. I look at this fund that my wife's invested as a TRA member in, and it has a 12.96 uh, rate of return over 10 years. And I took a million dollars of theoretical money and I found that if I would have invested $1 million at 1.5% for 10 years, uh, like our bonds are, that we invest in are about now, we would have had $1,160,540 after 10 years. If I could have got this Minnesota State Board of Investment record uh, of 12.96%, and other funds have lower rates of return, I understand that, for 10 years, we would have had $3,382,570. So we have an opportunity to uh, invest the way we are investing now and only get 34% of what this one theoretical thing is. So uh, I think this should be a nonpartisan thing that makes government more efficient for citizens of all of these types of cities. Thank you for your testimony, Mayor Blonigan, with an I. We're grateful that you're here. Welcome Madam to the committee, Mr. Carlson. <laughs> Madam Chair and members, my name is Gary Carlson. I'm with the League of Minnesota Cities. We represent 837 of the 854 cities in the state. Uh, thank you uh, uh, again, Senator Wesland, for uh, introducing this bill. Uh, many of you may recall that this bill was the compilation of two bills last year. One was authored by Senator Rest and one was authored by Senator Utke. Uh, and uh, Mayor Blonigan spoke to the portion of the bill more related to Senator Rest's bill last year. Uh, and I'm going to speak more to the second half of that bill that deals with the insurance trust investment opportunities that are contained toward the end. This was in the uh, Utke bill last year. Um, Madam Chair, members, basically our insurance trust, there are four local government insurance trusts that do insure our cities for property casualty and workers comp. Uh, the insurance trust for the counties does the same and for the school boards and the townships. We have seen a great influx in the number of especially workers comp claims, uh, many of them related to post-traumatic stress that are now long-term obligations for those uh, insurance trusts. And we're looking for the opportunity to invest much longer term because when an officer goes out and is injured when they're 35 or 40 years of age and they cannot return to work, uh, we have the obligation to pay their worker comp claim uh, for the duration. And so what we're looking for here is investment authority 
uh, for the insurance trust uh, that is uh, codified in, in Minnesota Statute 11A24, which is identical to what is authorized for the State Board of Investment. Uh, Madam Chair, I will really stand for questions. I think Mr. Mossman also has some uh, comments to make, but we really would encourage you to consider this bill and, uh, and pass it along. Mr. Mossman, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Uh, thank you, Chair Murphy and members. Matt Mossman with the Minnesota Inter-County Association. MICA represents 15 of the larger, faster-growing counties um, in the state. Testifying in support of uh, Senator Westland's bill, and, and thank you for, uh, to her for offering it. MICA was at the forefront and participated uh, in development and supported this legislation in 2017 when it first came along. And we continue um, to support this legislation uh, today, making the adjustments so that uh, additional counties and additional um, cities can participate. You know, the, the background that I would add just to the, to the testimony that you've uh, already heard is that in practice, counties and other local governments are required to recognize and plan for a, lot, a number of long-term uh, liabilities, post-employment benefits, long-term uh, environmental care, stewardship of landfills if they're owned by local governments, com uncompensated uh, absences, um, and that sort of thing. And as these balances have accumulated, many local governments are sensibly saying, how can we um, uh, get more than one to two percent on those investments? So this authority is very, it's limited, both in terms of the types of uh, assets that can be uh, invested in, the proportion of assets that can be invested in, and the tools that are available, uh, and the transparency that local governments need to follow in doing so. So we support um, uh, the legislation moving forward to provide additional opportunities. Thanks, Senator Jasinski, as well, for supporting uh, and sponsoring the legislation again this year, and happy to, to answer, along with Mr. Carlson, any questions, but we think this is a, a sensible addition uh, to the current law. Thank you very much, Mr. Mossman. Senator Westland, anything more before we go to questions? I think the only, the only other thing that I would add is that the, um, the bill does require, um, um, in Section 4, Subdivision 3, it does require that the, the governing body has to adopt an investment policy. So it does um, have some local control and uh, requires them to develop a, a policy of their own before they... Uh, take advantage of this um, this investment opportunity. Thank you, Senator Westland. I see Senator Lang has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, thank you, Mr. Musman, for uh, when I was pointing and saying, oh, stay there for just a second. <laughs> I was trying to get away. I appreciate that. Uh, you, you mentioned something that was uh, on the forefight, uh, forefront of my thoughts is the transparency aspect to this. I think, I think it's a good idea if uh, our communities have a little more freedom in, in how their monies are spent, but Oftentimes here in the legislature, we get talked about doing things behind closed doors and uh, the transparency we provide to the public. And you did mention it. Can you? Is there a truth and taxation meeting when it comes to the investments of a of a municipality, or is there something planned that uh, whether your agency or or uh, the counties has in mind? Mr. Massman, Madam Chair and Senator, and I think Senator Westland just uh, just uh, 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 touched on it. Uh, there is both a resolution that has to happen and be approved by the local government, so in a public um, meeting that would set forth the policy, and there needs to be an investment policy in place before they could do any of this. And then, of course, the tools are limited to what's in statute as well. Senator Lang. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I guess the next question is, like, is there a break even if things go the opposite way? I know that, that over the last few years it's been uh, a positive investment atmosphere, but what happens when it goes the other way? Is there a at some point in time when uh, municipalities as a whole would divest and, and, and walk away from investment. Mr. Massman. Um, Madam Chair, I, I think it's also, I, I think the, the, the foundation to that um, is to keep in mind that, again, these are already long-term um, assets and liabilities on both sides of the equation. So I think there's, there's a limitation as to how much you know, this isn't just general fund cash um, in large scales that local governments are investing with in terms of near-term resources. These are their, uh, generally speaking, their long-term um, assets that are 
you know, a best example, a, a key example that's come forward um, from the counties in my membership that are interested is uh, Rice County that owns a, a landfill and is a, responsible for the long-term care of that um, landfill decades out. And the assets they have are required to put in place to do that um, are just sitting there at sort of one and two percent rather than being able to be invested in something that is uh, on that same timeline. Thanks, Senator Lang. Are there other questions? Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think maybe along those lines, I'm, I'm wondering if, um, you know, once this has been approved and once people have, I mean, it, you say it's a long-term investment, if I, I'm thinking of uh, from a bonding viewpoint uh, where you lose your rating from, say, a AAA to a AA and, and then go down farther, is it a possibility that in this same situation that could happen to say, your county or your uh, city or things like that, where they lose that, do they then in turn lose the uh, ability to be able to use this uh, language that we're ha having before us uh, for the purposes that you would like? Mr. Mossman. Um, Madam Chair and Senator, yes. The, the way the, the language is structured is that it is based on the most recent rating if they lost that rating, the investments that they had in place at the time that they lost that rating could remain in place, but they couldn't make additional investments until that rating was retained or returned to. Senator okay. Anderson. Thank you. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Weston. Again, thanks for bringing this bill forward. Uh, Senator Rest and myself had many conversations on this bill, and so I, I'm sure when it came up and Senator Rest was interested, she probably sent you to my desk, which I, you did show up and, and a offer it to me, so I do appreciate that. Uh, as a mayor of Faribault for eight years, it's something that, it's definitely a valuable tool. Uh, talking to a lot of my uh, elected officials in the county and the city level, uh, this is something that will obviously allow them to get better returns and, and better plan and use their money more effectively than it is really the citizens' money. So I think it's a good bill. I think there's enough um, uh, rails on it that protect the cities and the counties. Uh, again, with the transparency issue of having to have a resolution to do this uh, with an investment policy. Uh, so again, I think it's a good bill and, and I think it's something our, our local uh, government entities can really take advantage of. So thank you again and I appreciate the bill. Thank you, Senator Jasinski. Are there other questions? All right, then. Seeing no further questions, thank you, Senator Westland. We're going to lay Senate File 323 over for possible inclusion in an omnibus. Thank you very much, Mayor. Appreciate you being here. Thank you, Madam Chair. You bet. Uh, next, I believe we are going to call up Senator Marty's bill. Who I believe Senator Marty's in the hallway, and so there he comes. Just like that. It's like you could hear through the walls. Senator Marty. Welcome to the committee. I'm going to move Senate File 833, so it is before us. And I understand that you have an author's amendment. Yes, um, Madam Chair, I have the A1 amendment. All right, members, in your packets, uh, you have both the bill and the A1 amendment. Senator Marty, I'll move that A1 amendment, so it is before us. And Madam Chair, the A1 amendment does two things. One, these were provisions, well, one of them was a provision the House, two of the three were provisions the House put in the bill, one of which was to delete the last three lines of the bill, which I believe is unnecessary, uh, unnecessary to have in the bill. And number, the second one on line 1.3 is simply capping the amount of the license fee at $150 a year. And the third one was one that um, I think um, hospitality industry and others pointed out that we should define hotels to include basically um, in 327 um, hotels includes everything, motels, um, all sorts of lodging establishments. And so in effect, they'd all be covered the same. So I, I won't describe it as a technical amendment, but it's, um, I think there are minor changes, and I'd urge you to put them on. Seeing no questions, uh, all those in favor of the A1 amendment, please say aye. Aye. And those opposed say no. And the amendment is adopted. Senator Marty, the bill before us, would you like to briefly introduce it and invite your witnesses to the table to testify? Thank you. And I have, I believe, the Roseville Police Chief here and um, Chief Schneider. And um, I'm not sure if I have any other witnesses. I think there may be others wishing to testify, and I think the city of Roseville here is, is here as well. But this actually, a few years ago, the legislature gave authority to Wake Park to impose a 
licensure on hotels because they had problem establishments with, um, with uh, sex trafficking and drug dealing and other things, and they felt they had no way to enforce it, so they asked for permission. The legislature gave the city of Wake Park permission. And this would, Roseville's had a problem with this for a number of years, and we'd like to do it statewide and make it available. And Chief Schneider is here. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome to the committee, Chief. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Sure. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Erica Scheider. I'm the chief at the Roseville Police Department. I've been a police officer for 25 years. Um, I'll start by saying, first off, that most of our hotels are very safe, and we have really good managers that we work closely with. Unfortunately, we have a small number of troubled hotels that continue to be a drain on our police services, and they negatively impact the overall safety of the community as well as the businesses around them. Roseville does not have our own health board, so we rely on Ramsey County, so under the current statute, we, are, we have very little local control. Over the past few years, we've noticed an increase in criminal activity and deteriorating con conditions at a couple of our lodging uh, properties, including human trafficking, robberies, drug activity, and assaults. Over the past several years, three out of every four police calls to hotels are at our three problem uh, properties. And I'll just briefly share just a couple stories that kind of illustrate the seriousness of the problem. Over the summer, we had a person in a medical uh, emergency outside one of our hotels, and the staff refused to call 911. Thankfully, a Good Samaritan jumped in and helped, and we were able to respond and deliver Narcan, uh, discovering that the person was overdosing. A few months ago, a live-in staff member at one of our problem hotels admitted he solicited sexual services from a female and then smoked methamphetamine in the room that he was living at, at the hotel. She later came forward alleging a sexual assault. Recently, we had someone living at one of our hotels that claimed that she was fine and evicted by the hotel staff after she called 911 for a domestic uh, situation. And just to note, our three uh, problem properties are the top locations for overdoses in our city. Despite our efforts to address the issues by communicating with hotel management and applying our uh, lodging nuisance ordinance, we continue to have serious safety concerns and we're not seeing significant improvements. Complaints are coming from nearby businesses who are looking to relocate we also have had other hotels who have lost customers because of the deteriorating conditions in the area. We also hear uh, safety concerns from people that work and uh, live in the area. If you just go on and read some of the online reviews, it's, it's horrifying um, what people are seeing when they go to these hotels. The City of Roseville and the Police Department have used every available tool that we have to try to um, address these is issues, including county health inspections, fire and code inspections, criminal investigations, and a repeat nuisance lodging ordinance, but they're not enough. And so we, we support any legislation which would allow more local control to address the uh, increasing public safety issues at our lod lodging establishments. And I thank you for allowing me to come in and speak today. Thank you very much, uh, Chief Schneider. We appreciate your testimony. I have on the list uh, two other people uh, who I believe might be interested. Are there others here? Anybody from uh, TPI Hospitality or from Hospitality Minnesota? We'd like to welcome you up uh, to the witness table and to offer your testimony. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good afternoon, members. <clears throat> My name is Robert Kissabeth. I'm the chief, op op chief operating officer with TPI Hospitality. We operate 35 hotels, six restaurants, and two convention centers throughout the state of Minnesota. And we also have five hotels in Roseville. Um, thank you for the opportunity for me to speak today um, regarding the hotel licensing. Uh, I come here with a shared goal with other testifiers in the Roseville community to help stop the problematic hotels. Over the years, there have been three hotels, which have been mentioned, that have posed a significant challenge for the city, impacting safety and the good reputation of Roseville hotels. At TPI, we have a lot of stake <clears throat> with this, with the five hotels in the city. We want the same results, the hotels where significant crime activity is taking place, to be held accountable. As an operator, all of our properties are licensed through the Minnesota Department of Health. Through these licenses, 
uh, through these licenses, I know and understand the rules and regulations uh, that are to be held at each property. Uh, as the bill is drafted, I'm not clear on the expectations or requirements of the additional license our hotels will have, depending on which city they're in. I recognize that Roseville, <clears throat> there are in Roseville there are challenges to unlock the right enforcement mechanisms for the problematic hotels. We would like to take the time to work with the city, county health officials, law enforcement, and appro appropriate stakeholders to get the legis legislation right. We recognize and agree uh, the need to shut down bad actors, but certainly hope there are, there are not uh, cons or there are, we hope there are considerations for the unintended consequences that impact these hotels uh, across Minnesota. It is important we get this right, achieve our shared goal that Roseville and every other municipality has safe hotels with good reputations. Thank you. We really appreciate your testimony. Thank you very much. Um, and stay close in case there are questions. And then I'd like to invite Ms. Sims. Welcome to the committee. Uh, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, members. My name is Jill Sims, and I'm the Director of Government Relations for Hospitality Minnesota. We are a trade association representing Minnesota's restaurants, lodging, resort, and campground sectors. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you on Senate File 833. We share the goal to bring accountability to hotels that poise a significant challenge to communities. To that end, we have always appreciated the opportunity to partner with law enforcement, local units of government, and other relevant stakeholders to mitigate circumstances that are not in compliance with state, federal, or local regulations. For example, in 2018, we collaborated with the state to develop hotel training for sex trafficking so operators could learn what to look for, how to respond um, to prevent sex trafficking, and save lives. We thank Senator Marty for his willingness to work with us on establishing a fee cap and updating the language to better reflect definitions of hotel, motels, and lodging establishments. As mentioned, hotel licensing is managed by the Minnesota Department of Health um, and has a very clearly defined scope, regulations, and expectations for all operators per Minnesota Lodging Rule Revision Chapter 4625, regardless if it's managed by MDH or a delegate. So there's currently 28 delegates. Um, those could be cities or counties that are allowed to manage a jurisdiction's licensing process. We recognize the problem that this poses for Roseville to do that, and it's not necessarily the right enforcement mechanism. Um, but to that, we hope to see language uh, that will better align and set better align with the Wait Park model. Um, and as Senator Marty referenced in 2017 in session law, um, there was language passed that clearly delineates uh, what the licensee should expect and what is not allowed. And we would like to continue to work with the author as well as the city officials, uh, League of Cities, county folks to get clear language that's agreeable to all. Um, and to that end, like I've already said, we're really committed to working with stakeholders so that we can hold the problematic hotel properties accountable for their actions while setting up municipalities and good hotel operators for success under clear guidelines. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony and thank you for being here today. Uh, Senator Marty, um, I understand that this bill doesn't have another committee stop and we were contemplating holding it over, laying it over for a possible inclusion in a policy bill. Um, I, sure, sure. And, and Madam Chair, I, I don't have anybody else to testify. I, I talked with the League of Cities. They are, this is not one of their agenda items, but I think they are very much supportive of their cities having ability to do this. And, and again, we're, we are trying to say that they can't put other conditions or requirements beyond state and, and local ordinances on this stuff, too. Um, and the Hospitality of Minnesota had come up with another list of things that they said we could add to it. I didn't, I talked with the attorneys and Senate Council and um, got the sense that the language we have here, I, I don't see it as a problem in terms of them going, either Roseville or other cities being, going overboard and being irresponsible in doing it, um, and we're not allowing them to do other licensing conditions beyond that. Um, and again, I think the difference here is the reason they want the licensure is health department inspections deal with a lot of cleanliness type of issues, and so, and I think that's very important, but this is a concern about some who may be allowing, they, the police and the city staff keep trying to go in and talk with them, and they're just totally non-responsive, and in effect, 
if they do have a license, they have a tool to get them to comply with the law. So that's what we're hoping to do. But yes, if you want to lay it over, whatever you think is most appropriate. All right. Thanks, Senator Marty. Senator McQuaid. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Marty. I just have a, a technical question. I was just looking at from the amendment, um, the definition. Did, would this then apply to Airbnbs? Yeah. Um, Senator Madam Marty. Madam Chair, I believe, yeah, it, Senate Council, it, it, the definition of 327.70, could you tell what all that includes? Council White. Uh, Madam Chair and members, the definition of hotel under Chapter 327 uh, is hotel means a hotel, motel, resort, boarding house, bed and breakfast, furnished apartment, house, or other building which is kept, used, or advertised as, or held out to the public to be, a place where sleeping or, house or housekeeping accommodations are supplied for pay to guests or for transient occupancy. So, Thank you, Council. So, Madam Senator Chair, Marty. Senator McQuaid, it's meant to cover all kinds of lodging establishments, which I think was one of the concerns of hospitality Minnesota. Uh, Senator McQuaid. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Murray. That is super helpful. I'm, I'm very supportive of the bill. I just wanted to make sure I understood the scope. Thank you. Are there other questions? Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Marty. And I, I think I agree with the bill. I mean, overall, we all agree with we want our hotels and safe. But um, I, I know sometimes, you know, different cities have different enforcement people and, and transition between staff. And, and usually these hotels have pretty significant investments in their community. I mean, we're talking millions of dollars. And if they got in a kind of a dispute, a personality dispute with someone who's regulating this, um, and all of a sudden they say, oh, we're going to pull your license, and now I have a $3 million investment in this community. Um, are there checks and balances or an appeal process? And again, overall, I agree with it because I think we all want that. But I also you know, think of the investor that has millions of dollars invested and have the ability of some person that was upset with maybe they stayed there one time and they didn't like their stay and they're going to get hard on them and they can say, oh, I'm not going to uh, renew your license. I mean, what is here to do that? I know most cities would have some type of a process, I would hope, but uh, there's nothing really in the bill about it. But is there concerns about that from the, you know, from the industry that, hey, I got, you know, $3 million invested in the hotel. I got a little bit of discrepancy. We've had some issues because obviously not everybody is always great. And, and the people coming into our hotels, I had apartments sometimes and when I had a bad tenant, it was very difficult to get rid of them. And no matter what you did as a landlord, they can still do what they want to do. So I, I just want to make sure there's some guidelines there that uh, these property owners, taxpaying property owners, if, if there is an issue, they have some type of an appeal process or something so they're not just getting thrown out of, of you know, over $150 license that they're done operating with that. So that would be my question, and I look forward to some comments. Senator Murray. Madam Chair, I'll, I'll let the two witnesses here comment on it from my perspective. Um, yes, I, I understand you can have an overbearing or obnoxious or something licensing official at times and so on. And I guess I'd say that we always have appeal in the courts. You always have the appeal if somebody's taking that away. I'm not saying that that's, you don't want it to go to that and I don't think it should and I don't think it would very often, but I will let the hospitality industry folks because they may say they would rather have some other appeal thing in there. Ms. Sims. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Marty and Senator Jasinski for your question. I think that's what we're, part of what we're looking for to delineate again when Wait Park did this, their language was very specific as to what you could um, put on a licensee, and then I, I should, I need to go back and check if there was some enforcement, you know, type of, uh, or what the court opportunities might be. But I, th I think we're committed to working with the city of Roseville with Senator Marty, which I will say he's been wonderful to work with and, and did hear us out yesterday. So we're very appreciative of that to get this right. Because again, we, we don't want to put good operators in a, in a bad situation, but we need to work. Um, some of these bad operators, as you heard by the chief, um, are putting communities and, and other hotel operator reputations at risk. And um, Madam Chair, if I might, I think, uh, Robert may have something to add, but I'll direct that back to you. Mr. Kissimuth. Thank you. No, it is a very big concern, uh, and, and I've worked in 14 different states, and, and, and a, a bad actor to close and pull your license is, is devastating. We have five properties, as I mentioned, in Roseville, ranging from $30 million to $20 million. Um, So we have a significant investment in the Rose, Roseville market, uh, and I would hate to see our license pulled uh, for something that was, was not warranted. Obviously, we want to be law-abiding, um, but it's just too vague, in my opinion. 
Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And Madam Chair, one follow-up. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you. And again, so, and I've brokered some hotels for, for property owners, so I know the cash flow sometimes, uh, the time you would be shut down is during certain periods is pretty uh, uh, important. So if it was, you know, before Christmas or something like that, some of those weeks or 4th of July, some of those weeks are very, very important. So in as, as you go forward, think about, you know, what, what's that appeal process in a number of days you'd be closed down because, again, shutting a hotel down for eight or nine days sometimes in certain instances could be, could put them at, you know, in a huge disadvantage financially and then, then they're, it, they're sunk basically. So as long as they have some appeal process and it, it's done quickly that they can at least talk about it and have the opportunity to correct the issue uh, so they're not shut down for a time that would actually force them into a bankruptcy type issue or they're upside down or whatever it could do. So just wanted to add that in. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Jasinski. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, to the testifiers or Senator Marty, uh, was there a fiscal note requested on this? Mr. Erickson. Uh, Madam Chair, there's no fiscal note on this one. This would be uh, limited to, to locals. There's no fiscal impact to the state. They're not changing state licensing procedures or anything along those lines. Senator Anderson. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, the, right now, from what I heard the testimony is, this kind of language is now uh, being used by the city of uh, Wake Park. Uh, any other city in the state of Minnesota that is in this situation needing this kind of language to help them um, in Senator. dealing with their hotels or other situations? Senator Madam Martin. Chair, Senator Anderson, I believe, I, I know, I believe home rule cities are allowed to license hotels. I know Minneapolis, St. Paul, all the bigger cities do. I'm not sure if it's cities. Um, I think it's home rule charter cities are allowed to do it, but I'm not, no, Senate Council. <laughs> We do have um, our council here with uh, more information about what they've done in Wake Park. Um, Madam Chair and members, it's my understanding that um, cities that have a locally delegated health agency can license hotels under the Department of Health, but those licenses are primarily related to health and sanitation issues, um, which would, this um, bill would go beyond the health and sanitation um, issues to, you know, nuisance and breaking the law and things like that. So, Madam Senator Chair. Senator Anderson. Ms. White, so a home rule city like Minneapolis, St. Paul, could adopt this language also or not? Council White. Um, Madam Chair and Senator, um, they can license hotels, but they're restricted by the provisions of the health department in which the health department licenses hotels for purposes of, um, you know, health and sanitation type issues. Um, so they can do it under that purview. This bill um, expands the authority of the cities to license and um, require compliance with other laws besides the health and sanitation. So, Madam Chair, Senator Anderson. Ms. White, they would have to, if they wanted to utilize, they would have to bring for, ask for further clarification of language to help them out in their, uh, as a home rule city. Am I understand that it sounds like what you told me first was this doesn't apply to them or they couldn't use this. Sounds like if they wanted to use something like this, they'd have to have their own legislation. Am I correct or wrong? Senator Marty. Madam Chair, I guess I'm unaware. I thought Minneapolis and St. Paul and bigger cities all had the authority to license beyond just the health licensure. I may be wrong in that, and Ms. White, you're indicating they don't. Council White. Madam Chair, members, that's my understanding. I think Wade Park is the only city that was given the authority to go beyond the health and sanitation, and they have um, a pretty extensive ordinance related to the licensure of hotels. And Madam Chair, Ms. Sim says that 28 cities or counties, 28 local jurisdictions have the, are covered by the local health licensure authority. So at least 28 cities or counties, like Ramsey County, I believe, has that authority. But, um, but I think that my understanding was that the bigger cities have more extensive licensing requirements that can go beyond that. But I... I may be wrong. I just that was an assumption I had. 
Okay. Thank you, Mr. Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Marty. I, I just look like it there doesn't uh, doesn't really give any further clarification. And to me, it looks like the Home Rule City, like you mentioned, could easily pick up this language and go forward with it. But, uh, and, and Senator Marty. And Madam Chair, if you are going to lay this over for possible inclusion, I'm not sure that the that this is too loose in terms of what they should be able to license over. Uh, I have sympathy to making sure there's an efficient appeal process. Um, I think as Senator Jasinski said, you don't want somebody to say, okay, well you did one thing wrong and we're gonna shut you down for eight days or whatever. But I mean, I, I have a feeling hotels would be in court pretty quickly about that and so on. But making sure if there is a way to have a logical uh, I don't. I don't see anything, and I'm not hearing from them what where overkill might be in terms of what this is giving them authority to do. I think it's appropriate to talk about what kind of a of a appeal process they have. So, and I'd be happy to continue working with the industry if you're going to be putting this in an omnibus bill. Thank you, Senator Marty. Are there further questions for the senator or for the testifiers who are here? Seeing no further questions, then I will move that um, Senator Marty's Senate File 833 as amended be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Thank you for being here. All right. Senator Dibble. So many firsts today in state government. Senator Dibble, your first visit this cycle. We're glad you're here. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself. I'll move Senate File 658 be before the committee. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members. I am pleased to be here. I'm State Senator Scott Dibble uh, and happy to have the opportunity to present Senate File 658, um, which uh, comes to you by way of the Energy Committee. Um, and just uh, real briefly, um, an overview of 658 would propose to address um, what would be, I think, a gap in consumer protection law, actually, vis-a-vis -vis utility companies and uh, ratepayers, customers in Minnesota, one of the only states that does not allow for uh, customers uh, the right of an appeal when they have a matter of mm -hmm. dispute um, that they would bring to the Office of Consumer Affairs at the Public Utilities Commission. Um, that what, what would happen uh, today is that if you had a, a, a matter uh, that you needed to bring to the Public Utilities Commission, the Office of Consumer Affairs would make their determination if it's adverse, you really wouldn't have the right to appeal that decision to the Public Utilities Commission itself unless you could find 49 other people with the exact same complaint. Um, and uh, of course that would be um, difficult. The other problem is that uh, those decisions uh, by that office are, are not deemed to be final in a way that would then allow you to jump out of that process and pursue your rights in the courts. Um, so, so this would remedy that. It would allow the Public Utilities Commission to take up uh, a matter of complaint or dispute. Um, and they have a number of things that they can do. They can dismiss it, they can resolve it, or they can refer to the Office of Administrative Hearings. And then, of course, um, if that decision is adverse to the interests of the consumer, that would be deemed a final decision, then they could access the courts. The reason we're here, Madam Chair, um, is because um, there is a granted a rulemaking authority permissive. Uh, and if, you're, if the bill is in front of you, you can turn it to the very back and look at page four, lines 4.1 to 4.2. And it says the commission may adopt rules to carry out the purposes of this section. Hence, that gives this august body jurisdiction over this matter. Um, I have Ron Elwood here from Legal Aid, um, who is a proponent and champion uh, of this idea, was the one who discovered this deficiency and brought this solution to this problem to the legislature. And he can either testify or respond to questions, whatever is your wish. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Elwood. If you'd like to introduce yourself, if you have brief remarks, that is great. It is uh, the rulemaking provision that brings you to this august committee. There's also a fiscal note in our packets, which we'll ask Mr. Erickson to speak to briefly, but we'll begin with you, Mr. Elwood. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Ron Elwood with Legal Aid, and I just want to thank Senator Dibble for carrying this bill. We have had situations uh, over the years where these uh, kinds of complaints are uh, should be heard before the commission, and just by a quirk of law, it, they can't be, and we're the only state in America like that, as Senator Dibble said. I'm happy to answer any questions. Again, it's just we're here uh, for the permissive rulemaking provision, and again, thank you for hearing it today. Thank you, Mr. Alwood. Uh, Mr. Erickson, would you like to speak briefly to the fiscal note? Yes, Madam Chair, I'd be happy to. Uh, the, the fiscal note, which you'll find in your, your packets, um, has a number of agencies assigned to it. Two of them are in state government's jurisdiction. On page 8, you'll find the Office of Administrative Hearings, and on page 10 is the Attorney General. Uh, the, the part that the Office of Administrative Hearings plays in this bill is that appeals would be heard by the OAH, and then those charges uh, would be uh, billed by the OAH back to the PUC, uh, making that portion revenue neutral. The Attorney General expects that there may be some consultations or representation uh, amounting to about $13,000 in each year, which they say is an absorbable cost. To the rulemaking question, which often involves the OAH, the assumption by the PUC in the bill is that rulemaking would not be conducted, so they haven't included those costs in the fiscal note. If they did, those two would be done and then billed back uh, for, by the OAH for anything that was that was done there. Uh, thank you, Mr. Erickson, uh, for that brief but very clear explanation. Members, this bill will leave us when it leaves us today and head to judiciary. Members, are there questions for the author? Holy buckets. <laughs> then seeing no further questions, uh, all those in favor, Senator Dib Dibble, did you want to say anything more before we move? No, I don't want to jinx myself. <laughs> <laughs> so then all those in favor of Senate File 658 uh, be uh, recommended to pass and, and re-referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety, please say aye. aye. And those opposed say no. And that motion is adopted. Thank you, Thank Madam you Chair and time. members. We'll see you later. All right. Up next, Senator Hoffman. Senate file 439. Welcome to the committee, Senator Hoffman, and I'll move Senate file 439. So it's before the committee. Please introduce yourself uh, you. and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. John Hoffman, Senate District 34, the great city of Champlin, Coon Rapids, Brooklyn Park, Rogers, and Dayton. Um, I just wanted to let you know, Madam Chair and members, that there was another stop in this uh, uh, traveling of this bill that last year uh, went through all the committees, made it to the floor, was passed, was in a conference committee report, that passed, and then nothing happened. And it just so happens this is the legacy of David Tomasoni, who was my mentor for 10 years, and I just need to be, to let you know, Madam Chair, that the uh, Health and Human Services uh, Committee does not need to hear this bill. They said they would waive it, so just wanted to let you know, so it would be hopefully the, the uh, uh, disposition of this group uh, if you do pass this that it go right to the Senate floor so members and, and uh, uh, chair since 1971 the Minnesota Higher Ed Facility Authority has provided low-cost tax-exempt financing for Minnesota not-for-profit colleges and universities this bill authorizes the authority to expand its ability to assist qualified not-for-profit hospitals and not-for-profit senior living organizations to receive financing assistance from the authority. And that authority under Senate File 439 would be renamed the Minnesota Health and Education Facilities Authority. The bill also increases the cap on the aggregate outstanding bond amounts to $4 billion. And that would also allocating $1.75 billion to fund higher ed projects and $2.25 billion to fund health care projects. This type of conduit financing for higher education and health care is norm in over 30 other states, including Wisconsin and other Midwestern states. The expansion of this authority's issuance will provide additional low-cost financing options for health care and senior living borrowers. The experience and expertise of the authority in evaluating financing requests and obtaining low-cost tax-exempt financing provides a strong value-added option for healthcare and senior living borrowers. 
And, and members, you need to know that the authority receives zero, no state funding, and the bonds issued by the authority for qualified borrowers are not debt to the state of Minnesota. So there is no pledge of any state revenue nor guarantee direct or indirect, and that is provided to secure the obligations issued by the authority. The authority also has no taxing power. So I can go into the uh, legislation will aid the authority that's, that's going to be repaid directly by borrowers, you need to know too, Madam Chair and members. But the benefits are it provides expanded low-cost capital finance options for nonprofits. That's healthcare entities and senior living organizations. This would have been very a boon and helpful to greater state Minnesota. To enhance access to tax-exempt financing, there's no cost, no cost to the state of Minnesota taxpayers. And I say that again, Senator Jasinski, there's no cost to the state of Minnesota taxpayers. There's no direct or indirect pledge of any state funds or guarantees. And what that does is it helps to keep project financing costs low by using tax-exempt rates. The borrower, the borrower fees, it's a mouthful, pay all the authority operating costs. And the borrower's fees pay also all financing costs. So what that does is it removes risks associated with local government. And I suppose that's the reason why you wanted to hear the bill here. And it enhances the local economic development efforts. It allows local government to leverage their bond capacity. It's a cost-effective additional financing option for greater Minnesota. I repeat that, what I said earlier. And, and again, that's the additional value-added services for borrowers. And, and the only thing um, that I understand you should be discussed or discussed in the committee is the fact that the current state agency will be able to help more organizations with its experience and bonding authority. And so uh, with that, um, members, um, uh, Barry Fink, who is uh, here with the uh, authority, uh, can answer any questions. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Senator Hoffman. I appreciate that. Uh, and we're doing just a little tracking down on the disposition or next steps of the bill, um, just because there was some discrepancy in what I was told. Um, so I'm, I'm just doing a little homework there. But Mr. Mr. Fick, is that right? Yes. Welcome. Uh, it was good to see you in higher ed last week. And as I promised you, uh, here we are quickly uh, to take up this proposal. So please introduce yourself. Uh, welcome to the committee and proceed. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. My name is Barry Fick. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Higher Education Facilities Authority, and I'm here today in support of the legislation that Senator Hoffman has discussed with you, and I'd be pleased to respond to any questions or provide any additional information that you think is appropriate. Madam Chair. Senator Hoffman. Thank you. I just want to add one more thing. This is a non-controversial bill, and there is no, no opposition to this bill. Thanks, Senator Hoffman, for saying that. Members, do you have questions for Senator Hoffman or for his witness, Senator Lang? Thank you, Madam Chair. And Senator Hoffman, I appreciate that because I am on board with this bill. So, <laughs> I, I, You just said it with a, such a straight face. But uh, no, I do have a question, and I guess it's a little uh, off topic more than anything, but we're talking about uh, you know, the ability of schools to do things. So uh, Senator Westland just had a a bill in just a little bit ago, and I don't know if you were in the hearing yet, but it talked about additional investment opportunity. What's, uh, what's the opportunity, and I don't know if this is a question for yourself or the testifier, for uh, investment of this sort to, that Senator Westland was talking about? Is there, is there such an opportunity like that? No. no. Mr. Is that, Vick. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Senators and committee members, no, this does not revolve, involve any investments by uh, local governments. Senator Lang. I, I, let me clarify. <laughs> Is, do, do you have that ability as an entity to make investments like that, oh. dollar values? Because, I mean, realistically, we were talking about with the bond proceeds, what, what, what do you leverage that against? And it's like, well, tuition or, or when it comes to uh, uh, you, you, elderly folks, I suppose it's some sort of a rent or, or you know, Medicare payment, Medicaid payment. Do you have the ability to invest those funds, much like in, in Senator Westland, the the local municipalities do. I mean, it's, I don't think that's something outside of the scope of the operation of what we're all talking about here. Mr. Fick. Madam Chair, uh, Senator, members of the committee, uh, we do not have that ability at this point. Our limitation is under Section 118A of Minnesota statute, so we're pretty much limited to certificates of deposit or U.S. government securities. 
Uh, what we do is provide the financing for the project so that if there are, for example, during the construction period, there are construction period funds that are available, we can work with the borrower to invest in guaranteed investment contracts, again, as authorized under 118A, and receive a higher rate of return that way. But our primary focus is to make sure that the debt is repaid, so we are very, very reluctant to uh, take any risk with the borrowed funds because they have a specific use for construction of a project. And so we try to keep that's foremost in mind of our analysis. Mr. Lang, Senator Lang, Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. So this looks like uh, in changing it that are you, are you going to be uh, an entity unto yourself? Or are you going to be under the umbrella of higher education or health? Or where, where, where do you fit into the, the state government uh, realm of, state of uh, different agencies? Senator Hoffman. Uh, Madam Chair and, and Senator Anderson, I think it's, this is the smallest state agency in the state of Minnesota. You're looking at him right here, Senator <laughs> Anderson. It's an actual state agency. So I mean, if you want to add more to that, Mr. Fick, that no, would be Senator, Mr. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator, we would remain an independent state agency uh, on an oven on our, on our own at that point. With two, so two Madam Chair. Senator uh, Anderson. Senator Hoffman uh, or Mr. Fick, who will you report to? Strictly, strictly to the legislature or will you be reporting to some, some other agency or the governor's office? Mr. Fick. Madam Chair, Senator, and members of the committee, we would be, we would be reporting to the legislature and to the governor at that point. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Hoffman. So I have some serious concerns about the bill, and I, I think I'm going to oppose it just because then somebody would oppose it for you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> thank you for bringing the bill forward. I just had to see if I get a chuckle out of him. So. <laughs> May I respond, Madam Chair? <laughs> <laughs> Senator Hoffman. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you for your concern, Senator Jasinski. I'm sure our, our uh, you know, uh, the the... The, the original author of this bill, and it was done last year, would have probably uh, said, you better say that kind of comment. So, you know, this was really uh, Senator Thomas. And I'll never forget uh, Senator Jasinski as um, Rarick, Senator Rarick, and, um, was, was part of this. And, and um, Senator Thomasoni, before he could, um, when he lost, before he lost his speech, he... Uh, leaned into Doug Carna Carnavale and said, um, let's get this done. It's in. It's in. I mean, that was kind of, and so that's just kind of the, it's sitting here just going this, and, and what gets me, Senator Jasinski, is that it, it went through every committee it could last year, and it, it made it, you know, it's almost like, you know, the Twins or the Vikings, you know, you make it to that last game, and then you don't take it across the plate. I just want to take this across the plate, and I know you do as well, and I appreciate your comments. So, Madam Chair, thank you for letting me say that. Members, are there further questions for this proposal? You know, uh, later today we'll be taking up uh, two issues on the floor that have had many, many rounds through the legislature, so it's not uncommon uh, that something has to have more than one trip through the process or more than one trip around the sun before it gets its final day. Uh, Senator Hoffman, uh, today is the day uh, that we will be moving Senate File 439. Um, I, um, I did hear back from Senator Wickland, and she did uh, let us know that you two had talked together, although I think there might be a little bit of confusion. Um, so what we're going to do today is uh, move this to the floor, but Senator Wickland may come back to you, um, in which case we can have that conversation. So members, seeing no further questions, then I'll move that Senate File 439 be uh, general orders. Yeah, we're going to move it, and we're going to refer to the floor to general orders. Mm -hmm. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. And those opposed, say no. And that motion is adopted. Madam Chair, members, thank you. Thank you very much. We are expeditious and full of integrity in this committee. Last but not least, Senator Swadzinski and your booming voice. Welcome. 
Uh, to the committee, Senator Swadzinski. I'll move before us, Senate File 1086. Uh, it's before the committee, please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members. I have a few testifiers. The bill is, there's three letters in the file that I'd like to draw your attention to um, in the file, but I don't have them up here with me, but they're in my file. But the one I do want to draw attention to is the League of Minnesota Cities letter and the second paragraph in their letter from 837 members of the League of Minnesota Cities is a perfect capsule of what this bill tries to accomplish. And it, all it's trying to do is to remove the, um, repeal the compensation limit that's in statute that says um, um, many political entities cannot pay more than 110% um, um, of the governor's salary. Um, school districts were made exempt from that a few years ago, and so now school district superintendents can make more money than the governor, more than that 110% cap, um, but city managers and the like are still exempt from that. And so it really is somewhat um, punitive towards many of our communities. It, what this bill does is it uh, takes the decision making away from the state and returns it to the local communities and, oh, thank you. And the other two letters are from the Metro Cities and uh, the Municipal Legislative Commission. They all support this bill. And um, so it returns local control, takes the decision making away from the state, and uh, um, Free Enterprise will decide um, how people get compensated. So I think it's just interesting uh, that the superintendent of St. Paul Schools makes $256,000 for 33,000 students, and the city manager of Minnetonka makes just under $200,000 with twice the number of residents than students, and it just um, or points out the inequities of the compensation and the flaws that the bill has. So I do have a few testifiers. Come on up, please. Come on up. <laughs> and we are the only state, I believe, in the country that has this salary cap, so. Please uh, introduce yourselves for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and committee members. Uh, my name is Patrick Keene, and I'm a city council member from the city of Rochester. Uh, this is my first time testifying uh, in person, and I'm here today to speak in support of Senate uh, File 1086. Um, I've been on the council for the last four plus years. Uh, and I'm just starting my third year with our Rochester Public Utility on the Board of Directors as part of my council responsibilities. Um, our public utility has over 57,000 electric customers and 41,000 water customers. It is the biggest public utility in the state. Um, our city deals with uh, challenges created by the governor's salary cap in many departments. We've worked through the waiver process um, in the past, um, but we know the cap puts our city operations at a competitive disadvantage. Uh, today I want to focus on the public utility uh, that we operate. Our long-serving general manager uh, has announced his retirement plans for later this year and we're deep into the process of finding a replacement. Uh, given the large portfolio of specific skills for a public utility, we sought the services of professional uh, national recruiting firms. We heard back from some and one in particular I want to share with you. They commented that although they would like to work with a city like Rochester, their company no longer works with Minnesota cities because of recruiting with the state salary cap is too big of a lift and too big of a hindrance. The city of Rochester is going to be working to fill other positions in the coming year. Our finance director of over 29 years is retiring and we have a public works director that will probably be retiring in 2024. Um, um, we, have, we experienced uh, last year, two years ago, hiring a city uh, attorney, um, and one of the bigger problems we had is we could only get two, uh, we had two qualified candidates in the candidate pool, and we know just from experience that, that it really hurts your competitive nature when you're only getting so many, so many qualified candidates. Um, the state salary cap is a retention issue along with a recruiting uh, recruitment problem. At some point, the salary cap can become a demotivator uh, for being in the public sector in Minnesota. Uh, we want the best and brightest serving in roles that impact people's lives and the communities they live in. We operate an international airport, a wastewater treatment plant, public library, public transit systems, and other city services. 
we're close to the Iowa and Wisconsin borders and those states know about our cap and they know about our skills. Uh, top positions in smaller cities in Iowa pay above what we are able to offer and the impacts and impacts our ability to recruit and to retain. Over time, the private sector also understands our salary constraints and they know how to make competitive offers to our to many of our technical skills because of it. In closing, I want you to know that city councils like ours in Rochester take our fiduciary responsibilities um, as critical to our success. In Rochester's case, our combined services budget is over $600 million uh, for fiscal year 2023. We approve a tax levy each year and we are directly responsible to our voters uh, each election. And in between elections, we hear feedback from our residents and our businesses. Our council knows that our local revenue and budgets are limited, so financial decisions are made with the utmost care. Um, with this understanding, I encourage you to eliminate the state's artificial salary cap uh, and allow local city councils to address this topic, just as we do other topics like budgets, community development decisions, and other matters that are left to local control. So with that, I'll uh, listen for questions. Thank you, Council Member Keene. We appreciate you being here on a snowy day and welcome uh, on your first day of testifying in person. Uh, Ms. Stevens? Yes, um, thank you, Madam Chair um, and members of the, of the committee. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I currently serve as an executive recruiter for GovHR USA, which is a recruitment firm that works exclu exclusively with local governments across the country. Uh, prior to joining the firm in, the, in 2019, I spent over 20 years in senior leadership roles in local government, including serving as city administrator for Wilmer, Minnesota, and Cottage Grove, Minnesota, and I'm still based here in the Twin Cities Metro. Our firm has um, conducted over 900 recruitments in 41 states um, since 2009, including Minnesota. I would also um, uh, support my colleague who, who stated that the uh, salary cap is a barrier to recruitment. When I am recruiting candidates from outside of, trying to recruit candidates from outside of Minnesota to Minnesota and uh, for, for opportunities, it's, awful, it's often difficult to explain to them the salary cap. It is not something that they're familiar with. It's not something that exists in other communities. I recruit within the upper Midwest um, and I am also competing against my colleagues who are recruiting for those same positions. And my candidate pools typically will run half of what another candidate pool is in another, in another community in the upper Midwest. Many times the communities in Iowa, Illinois are already paying and those individuals are already paying at, um, at levels above our, the Minnesota salary cap. Um, the salary cap can creates compression within Minnesota local government. So it doesn't just impact the chief administrative officer position, it also impacts department director, police chiefs, and those other recruitments as well as it limits the compensation that's available for those, limits the market. It makes it even difficult to persuade candidates from move, to move from one ju local jurisdiction to another jurisdiction, taking on additional responsibility when there often isn't going to be additional compensation uh, for that as well. Um, the waiver process, um, is not always timely or guaranteed uh, for communities, and so that creates yet another barrier and uncertainty for a candidate. And in the current uh, local government job market, it is a shortage of talent. And so anything that um, is creating barriers for our, our clients, we recommend that they try to reduce those barriers. And so um, I also support kind of I also support. Re uh, repealing the salary compensation li limits in Minnesota. And I will say after spending 20 years in local government, I've worked with many elected officials who take their fiduciary responsibility very seriously. Um, I took that responsibility very seriously myself as a city administrator. And I think those decisions can be made at the local level and can be supported. Um, and individuals can be accountable for those decisions at the local level. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I believe there are two other witnesses, Senator Swadzinski, so I'd invite Mr. Carlson and Mr. Mossman. Welcome to the committee and please introduce yourself and proceed. Uh, Madam Chair, members, uh, Gary Carlson with the League of Minnesota Cities. Uh, thank you. I have submitted a letter and I will be very brief. 
I just want to accentuate one thing that we've heard most recently from our cities across the state, and that is even though the current salary cap is at $206,939 and it is adjusted for inflation, inflation isn't really even the big driving factor right now. It is the tight labor market. Uh, the labor market is so tight that I think if you talk with the state agencies about the number of jobs per employee or per prospective employee, it's two jobs for every one prospective employee. And I think at the local level, we suspect that it's even worse ratio in trying to attract and retain people. So the compensation cap is a problem. It is an issue that we think uh, its time has come and gone. Uh, the waiver process just doesn't work on a timely basis, and we do support the repeal of that particular uh, provision. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. Mr. Mossman? Uh, Madam Chair and members, Matt Mossman with Minnesota Intercounty Association. Uh, we as well um, support, have long supported uh, Senate File 1086 and the language. Um, you know, I would just underscore a couple of points because a number, a, a good amount of testimony has been provided, but we really think that this frankly restores a market-based approach um, to setting compensation and strengthens uh, local control and accountability. And it does so because it aligns the authority for the compensation decisions with the local elected officials that are accountable um, for the work uh, and the performance of the people that are hired. Thank you, uh, Senator Swazinski, for carrying the legislation. From the county perspective, I would just, you know, kind of context point out that the state government and the legislature and our system of delivering um, from human services to public health to public safety, local transportation networks, intersections with DNR and Minnesota Housing and MPCA, we entrust counties to lead um, and implement a wide range of complex uh, and important um, work on behalf of the people of Minnesota and quite often at the mandate and on behalf of the state of, uh, uh, of Minnesota. But we don't entrust uh, local officials to set the compensation levels of the individuals and the skill sets that they need to have in place um, to do that work and to be accountable for doing that work. So in addition to that being a recruitment, hiring, retaining, uh, a skill set challenge, I think it's, it, there's probably more than a bit of frustration that comes um, with that also. Let me just cite a couple of examples. Um, I know in particular um, uh, one county has identified uh, that there's significant compression issues uh, that go along um, with this uh, uh, cap being in place. Uh, another county has cited that they uh, had an occasion where they had three, an open HR um, position where they had three candidates from out of state all that backed out upon finding out about Minnesota's compensation limit. Um, we know that the, the waiver process is in place, um, but you know, frankly, from the perspective of, of some counties, the waiver process doesn't enhance, but it can actually um, contribute in some ways through nobody's fault to an unlevel playing field. I think MMB, um, we don't have any qualms with the work that MMB does. They're doing the best they can. It frankly is, uh, is a rework a lot of times of what goes on at the local government level to do comparisons um, with other governments. But in particular, um, one of the, uh, and there hasn't been as many waiver uh, request in the past couple years, but one in particular that sticks with us is several, I believe it was 2019, Olmstead County was denied a waiver request in the same year that the largest city in that county, Rochester, was granted a waiver request. At least part of the rationale was that Rochester was the third largest city um, in, in the state uh, and Olmstead County was maybe the seventh largest, Didn't, wasn't large enough of a county. Well. It's just, it sort of um, is, is not really reflective. And, and uh, you know, the other thing that I did, and then I'll close up um, just to uh, other states and surrounding states because the marketplace is broader than one county and broader than one state. I did um, do some looking just around what's publicly available and didn't verify these salaries, but there is the city, rap city of uh, Cedar Rapids, um, city manager, um, public websites uh, suggest that the salary there is $332,000. Um, the Davenport City Administrator, $234,000. I could go down the list through a number of neighboring states and communities, um, including the Dakotas, Iowa, and find um, higher salaries on publicly available websites. And it just, the point is, I have no idea if those positions compare or how they compare, but uh, the local governments should be able to do that and make those decisions and judgments based on who is in their candidate pool and who they feel they need 
um, to, to lead the, the uh, efforts at the local level. So we strongly support the legislation and hope you will as well. Thank you, Mr. Mossman. Members. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Swedinski and I have had lots of conversations about this back when I was the chair of local government. And obviously, look, and I, I think there are some pros and cons, don't get me wrong. Um, but looking at it, I was a mayor for eight years and we went through some staff and changed some staff over. I think the one thing back then to me again, so what's going to happen is all cities levies are going to go up because they're going to be paying more for their employees. Uh, and then other, I think greater Minnesota is going to be at a disadvantage because uh, communities like Edina and Bloomington has a much higher tax base and a city like Faribault or Otana or Wasika has much, much less tax base. And, and they're often dealing with the same issues, same complications, but now you're going to see a city like Faribault or uh, not be able to attract people and they're going to go to the metro and they're going to go to Edina and, and Bloomington, those places. So you're being set at a disadvantage in rural Minnesota because their tax bases are lower and they can't afford to pay those versus before when they had that level. I'd rather see the le level raised and then look at the waiver process. Because again, now in Minnesota, you're gonna see people moving around. They're gonna, some cities will lose those people because they can't, you know, they won't be able to afford that. Um, so that's a concern. And then a lot of times we did wage studies. So one city would do a wage study and see where everybody's at. And then a year later, another neighboring city would do another wage study and they will say, well, look at Faribault just increase there. So they'd raise theirs. And then city number three would come in the next year and they do a wage study and they say, well, these guys just raised. And then year four, Faribault's looking again another wage study and they're comparing to the last one. So it's just a cyclical thing that keeps raising people's uh, salaries up and it's kind of an artificial increase on top of inflation because there are, each city looks at each city when they do a, a wage study and again going back to the you know the competition for these cities the administrators or police chiefs or fire chiefs or you know director of engineering you name it now you're going to put rural Minnesota at a disadvantage because rural Minnesota does not have the tax base that a lot of the, the, the suburbs have and things like that when it had the, the limit, then it was much more balanced and, and you could attract more people in rural areas versus suburban areas or where the tax base was higher than other places. So again, that's my concern. I understand the pros and cons and some of the pros for you know local control and things like that. But remember, this, this is going to have a fiscal note to our local entities. I think there's 3,050 local government jurisdictions. And I would guess every single one of them will be seeing increases. And those increases get paid uh, by the taxpayer. They get pushed onto the taxpayer in local levy increases for attracting those uh, personnel people. So it does have a, a fiscal impact to Minnesotans, to taxpayers, because you're going to see higher and higher wages. And, and when it's been in effect for this while and, and there hasn't been an increase, uh, there's going to be a, a quick effect and then a domino effect to what's going to happen with our wages across the state. So that's my concerns. Again, good discussion. I appreciate the discussions we've had. We've had many challenging discussions about it. And, but those are my frustrations because, again, it is going to have a negative impact to, to certain cities, certain areas of the state, and to taxpayers. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Swadzinski. Thank you for your consistency over the last few years. Appreciate it. <laughs> Senator Anderson. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Swazinski or others that have testified, uh, other than the one that was mentioned regarding the uh, city of Rochester and the county of Olmsted being denied because of the waiver program, what other cities or towns or counties in the state have been denied through the waiver process when they've asked for that waiver uh, to raise the, the costs uh, or the uh, salaries of their employees? Mr. Mossman. I'll be happy to start while Mr. Carlson is, is looking. I don't have it. There's a list. It's, a, it's, it's a, the, the entire um, history of application, waiver applications and the outcome of those decisions is posted on the LCC website. Um, there's been um, hundreds of requests, but I, I don't. I'm trying to buy time for Gary to see if he finds it. But I, I know it's publicly available. I don't have the list in front of me right now. Uh, pardon me. So, Madam Chair. Senator Anderson. So do you know, just without knowing how many, how many have been denied other than Olmstead and Rochester? Mr. Mossman. So, and just thank you, uh, Madam Chair and, and Senator. So two things can happen when there's a waiver request. Um, the waiver request can either be granted but at a lower amount than what is requested. 
um, so that we would actually think of as an approval, um, but it's, it's different from what, what the request is. And then it could be uh, denied uh, outright. For example, I think in the example I cited, I think that Rochester's might have been granted at a partial, uh, a part of the request, and then Olmstead's was, was denied. Um, I wouldn't, I, I honestly wouldn't speculate. I think that I would, my hunch is that about probably a third of them have been uh, denied outright, but I, but again, I think it would be better to just get the sheet and follow up with you afterwards. That would be better. Mr. Carlson. Madam Chair, Senator Anderson, I did find the sheet and it's in about two point type, so it's a little hard to read here, but uh, it's, a, it's a long history of all of the waivers that have been requested and those that have been granted. And going back in time, a number of Minneapolis uh, waiver requests back in the 2000s were not granted. Uh, there was uh, a couple of Hennepin County, Olmstead County, Duluth Seaway Port Authority, uh, Hennepin County that was not granted. Um, I could do a more complete list for the committee. Here's one for the city of Hutchinson. I think that was a utilities commission. Uh, two more for Olmstead County. So there is a public record, as Mr. Mossman indicated. Um, the other thing that does happen, though, I should say, is that sometimes MMB grants a partial waiver, uh, not to what the entity, the jurisdiction was requesting, but only a portion of that. And so th although those were waivers from the actual cap, uh, they were less than what was deemed to be necessary by the city or the county to, to attract and retain staff. So we could maybe parse it that way as well. Well, Madam Chair. Senator Anderson. Uh, Mr. Carlson, uh, I, in my county, uh, I have not heard a, a lot of problems with uh, looking at, and I, I kind of echo what uh, Senator Jasinski was just saying, that for outstate or out in the rural areas, we don't see, it doesn't seem to have a, a lot of angst uh, regarding this situation. Maybe more in the rural areas or the larger cities things like that where it is. But to me, uh, the, the system that we have now with the waiver, uh, I haven't had a, a major, where does this bill go to next? Uh, Senator Anderson, we're gonna lay this over. Lay it over? Okay. Uh, well, I, I, I think uh, I, I, I like the system the way it is now. I don't see the need to, to raise the, or get rid of the cap, but uh, I appreciate you bringing it forward. And Senator Anderson, we're gonna lay it over here, but I know it is on uh, the, scheduled on the floor in the House. So they've moved it in the House. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And again, just going back to some of the discussions I had, and so I got a little time blank time there, so I Googled, and again, I remember, uh, and, and I admire Commissioner France from MMB before that, and he went to the University of Minnesota, but just an example of what can happen with these wages. So when uh, MMB, uh, Commissioner Fran France was at uh, MMB in 2019, his salary was $158,000. And I'm assuming that had something to do with the cap that was in place. Uh, with what's going on in the governor's salary, uh, went to the University of Minnesota in 2020, his starting salary was 399000 So again, when you take these caps off, this is what's going to happen. They're going to go up very increased and very quickly. Uh, and that's off the, I, I Googled what the salary was in 2019 when, it, when uh, Commissioner Franz was here. And then when he went to the University of Minnesota, I know there was a lot of uh, criticism about that from the Board of Regents on some, from some people. Again, so that's, that's what can happen. So in 2019, from 158000 under a cap to 399000 a year later. Um, so you can look at those two positions and say one's more difficult than the other, but when you take a cap off, this is what's going to affect our local governments and what the increases are going to be. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Jasinski. I am seeing, oh, Senator Lang. Thank you, yeah, Madam Two Chair. minutes left. What's that? <laughs> Two minutes left. Two minutes. Oh, I'll try to be quick. Uh, Mr. Keene had mentioned earlier t uh, today as we were going along that uh, this is an artificial uh, number. And I'm, I'm kind of curious when uh, this cap was first put in place and based on the governor's salary, what the uh, thought process was behind it. Why did they do that originally? Or who did that maybe? That should be a better question. I'm assuming it was the people sitting behind these desks. Why did they do that? Mr. Carlson. Um, Madam Chair, Senator Lang, uh, the, there was a, a compensation cap in place uh, way back in the 70s that was tied to the Commissioner of Finance, now Commissioner of MMB salary. That was repealed in 1980, uh, 80, 81, 82, right around there. And then they reinstated a cap based on the governor's salary, 95% of the governor's salary, in I think it was 1983. 
Uh, I don't remember the entire history of that. Of that, I. I believe that Senator Don Moe from St. Paul may have had some involvement in the uh, creation of that cap, but I don't recall. I had just started my career in the Minnesota State Legislature that year, uh, so I don't remember the whole rationale behind it. Um, but it was tied to the governor's salary, and then subsequently in, in 2005 is when we made the last major change to this law. Uh, that's when we basically did uh, tie it to the governor's salary at 110 percent and then indexed it for inflation because of problems that were created at that time. Uh, so this, this bill or this law has gone through many iterations. School districts were covered by this law up until 1999. Um, uh, to Senator Jasinski's point, I don't recall or have, have recalled hearing major problems between school districts around the state of Minnesota uh, attracting talent away from one another, but I could do more research into that for, with the school boards association and see if they remember anything to that effect as well. But uh, this, this bill has been, or this law has been around since the early 1980s, and again, I don't know the exact genesis of it. Uh, except to say uh, it was, I believe, initiated by Senator Don Moe at the time. Not Roger, but his brother Don. <laughs> thank, thank you, Madam Senator Chair. My, I think you're kind of proving my point for me that uh, I think the legislature probably should have a role in somewhat of this and what the, they looks like at the state. This is the second time in two weeks we're, you know, giving up authority uh, as a legislature to uh, another. In fact, in this, this bill, it's just a repealer. It's just kills the whole thing. Um, so I guess maybe the question of Senator Suzvinsky is why didn't we just look at this from a more practical standpoint and say maybe it should be 200% of what the governor makes or some other, you know, the other bill we talked about had a very specific number on it, uh, pulling power away from the legislature. Now now we're kind of doing the same thing here, but we're just like removing this. And, and I assume the legislature did this and I, I really couldn't find a whole lot of history, but they did it to have some sort of, you know, constituent control of what's going on uh, because then what ends up happening I, be, I believe is that you beca it becomes a competitive bidding process to try to find the best people and uh, at these high levels of government which it gets pretty expensive I think Senator Jasinski said that uh, in a pretty elegant way so I, I guess I'm a little concerned about it I don't necessarily disagree with the concept it, I, I find myself again in a strange position where I agree with the concept, but I think we should probably retain some control over it. Um, I, I tend to trust legislators of the past a lot more than, than uh, well, I'll just leave that there, Madam Chair. <laughs> <laughs> Th thank you. Thank you, Senator Lang. I appreciate that discussion. <laughs> Senator Swazitsky. Closing comment? Yeah. Um, I appreciate the four testifiers. I appreciate my colleagues. Maybe this might alleviate some of your concerns um, about the greater Minnesota not being able to compete, so to speak, but um, 854 cities in the city, in the state of Minnesota, many of them are from greater, I'm guessing the majority are from greater Minnesota, and 837 are members of the League of Minnesota um, cities, and they're endorsing this idea, so maybe that's something to chew on, but anyways, I thank you all for your thoughts today. Seeing no further questions, then Senate file 1086 is laid over for possible inclusion. There being no more business before this committee, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you.